have power, who will have wealth, and who will not. Milken surely understood uh, his power, but he felt that he was a that it was in the end a benign power, a power that was it was better for the country that he was exercising that power than that he were not, because he really felt he was democratizing the process of of, of the getting of wealth and power. James Goldsmith was by now one of the richest men in the world. He was worth over two billion dollars. He lived in New York in a large house built specially for him in the heart of Manhattan. It remains empty today, two years after his death. But Goldsmith was beginning to suffer from delusions of grandeur. He forgot that he was no more than a creature of the banks. And having taken over control of industry from the state, he decided he now had the power and the money to take over foreign policy as well. And the first thing he decided he would do was undermine the Soviet Union. Goldsmith believed that the growing anti-nuclear movement in the West was completely controlled by the Soviet Union. So he, and a number of other right-wing tycoons, set up a private organization to undermine the peace movement. Goldsmith was going to privatize Western intelligence. Privatized counter-subversion was the attempt we made to take over the job that had previously been done by uh, our counter-subversion service, which was MI5. And um, we, were able, we were able to do that because we had support from a number of tycoons in different countries who aimed at the collapse of the Soviet system. I hesitate to reveal who other people were apart from Jimmy Goldsmith who supported us. But I dare say, given the passage of the years, that Rupert Murdoch would not object to my mentioning his name. We shall overcome a kind of unofficial anthem of the World Peace Movement. Goldsmith's main target was the World Peace Council, an innocuous and ineffectual organization. But he was convinced that it was a sinister Soviet front. He spent millions of dollars on a series of deep, undercover operations to try and expose this. We managed to infiltrate the whole setup in a way which took the communist organizers completely by surprise. Uh, for example, when the World Peace Council meeting started in Copenhagen, two of our members had a banner, a very broad banner, which they unfurled, and they walked towards the podium so that the people in the audience could see behind what was written on the banner. Um, Welcome to the KGB's peace conference. And of course, there's a lot of laughter and a lot of shouts of indignation on the part of the communists. We can and shall save this world and save our children. Our children shall live, shall dance, shall play. All the children of the world, all the children of all the countries. Obviously, when Jimmy Goldsmith and other supporters of us heard about this, they were delighted. and They felt uh, vindicated. They felt that they had been supporting the right organization. Goldsmith's attempt to bring down communism was little more than a joke. But he increasingly saw himself as a powerful spy master. He paid for defectors to fly over to America on Concord, where he personally debriefed them. One defector, called Oleg Bitov, wrote a description of his meeting with Goldsmith. Пара детективов до биржевой справочника. 
Он был убежден, что врагов коммуниста вполне можно победить универсальным оружием, бездонным кошельком. Иллюзии своего всемогущества и тщеславия не имели у Голдсмита пределов. Вот и сейчас он выпустил клуб сигарного дыма и, решив продемонстрировать свое влияние, предложил устроить мне встречу с президентом Рейганом. Он даже поднял телефонную трубку, хотя это был уже чисто театральный жест. Из газет я знал, что Рейган только что утром отбыл в Европу. Was a fantasy. The men who really had the power were the bankers. They were using Goldsmith's bullying nature as a weapon to break down the corporations. But the bankers themselves were about to fall from grace, and Goldsmith would be left helpless and exposed. It began with a Wall Street dealer called Ivan Bosky. He had become one of the most important figures in the takeover movement. The moment he heard rumors of a takeover, Bosky bought millions of shares in the target company. The raiders needed them, and Bosky then sold them on for a vast profit. He constantly searched for the slightest clue to a takeover. Information to Bosky was everything. He had immense computer intelligence network, he had paid uh, spies everywhere. They, uh, one of his operations was said, for example, to track the movements of all the corporate jets in America, airport to airport. There was, because each of these jets has a, a registration number, he would have people find out what the registration numbers, which corporation's registration numbers in all the major airports in the country for corporate jets were. And those movements would be tracked by somebody in, in Bosky's uh, pay. Bosky had also created a system of informants inside the Wall Street banks. He bribed bankers to tell him when a deal was being planned and then bought shares. It was called insider dealing and it was illegal. But the bankers could make a fortune on the side. And by the end of 1986, Bosky had an intricate corrupt network which included even the most powerful bank of all, Drexel Burnham. Did you know that that sort of insider dealing was going on around these deals? I knew it was. Yes. I mean, I knew it all the time. I formed the conclusion very shortly after I arrived in America, and we always acted on this basis, that the, in general, the American investment banking community was not immoral, it was amoral. Some of the people in the most highly respected places were doing this. And, of course, where there is so much money to be made, everybody flourished. Everybody made money. Did you and Goldsmith ever do anything corrupt? No. Not consciously. Or unconsciously. Why did I qualify that? No, we didn't. <laughs> then suddenly, in November 1986, Bosky was arrested. It was also revealed that he had done a deal with the authorities. In return for naming all the bankers he had bribed, he would receive a lighter sentence. The New York District Attorney revealed that the takeover movement was riddled with corruption. As a result of his cooperation, we are examining things that we weren't examining before. And you know we wouldn't have been doing it without Mr. Bosky, because it was going on before and we weren't doing it. Um, as a result of his cooperation, a substantial systemic problem in the financial community was revealed and revealed in a way that moved us to try to make changes. Very suddenly, this whole other life of theirs is being revealed very often for the first time to numerous, numerous colleagues, to their family, sometimes to their wives. Uh, and that's a shattering experience. In fact, they're, they're seen usually as very shrewd, very capable, uh, very industrious, and yet there's this whole other side um, to their life in which they're cheating and lying and stealing, which they keep secret. Bosky's arrest came as a shattering blow to James Goldsmith. He was in the middle of the biggest takeover yet attempted in America, for the tyre company Goodyear. It had caused an outcry, and the revelations of corruption in the takeover movement gave politicians the chance to try and reassert control. Goldsmith was summoned to Congress to explain what he would do to Goodyear. 
You're deciding.